grab your Bibles, fire up your devices, Daniel chapter 7. Notes are in the bulletin. They're also on the app. Uh, first off, man, I, I want to give uh, props to Pastor Drew, man. Uh, so enjoyed sitting back listening to him preach these past two Sundays. That guy is phenomenal. So when you see him, encourage him. Uh, but uh, I, uh, I must say, I, I am glad to, to be back in the pulpit after two weeks. Uh, I got a whole lot to say. And well, uh, Sean has only given me a few minutes to say it in. So uh, let's, uh, let's get to it. There is more going on in our world than meets the eye. There is a whole lot more taking place in our world than you and I can see with the naked eye. And man, God's word speaks to so much of that. And this is one of the reasons Bible prophecy is so important to the believer is it gives us hope. It gives us peace because we know that God is ultimately in charge and his plan is coming to fruition. It will not be thwarted. It will not be prevented. And my friends, we can rest in his sovereign care when we see things in the world go wonky and wild and crazy. Amen? So in Daniel chapter 7, a couple of weeks ago, we surveyed key events in the Lord's plan for the future. And in this overview, there was a strange yet very important little detail that we looked at very briefly for just a moment or two a couple of weeks ago. It was this growth and dominating influence of a small horn among 10 other horns. Do you recall we talked about that for a moment? We discovered that this 11th horn represents a person with dynamic leadership ability and power who will become the very last and final dictator on planet Earth. Now, because this individual is going to play such a strategic role in the events of the future. Now, let me be the first to say, we don't know when those events will take place. They could be, uh, well, here in the next moments, or they could be 100 years from now. Uh, but we need to understand what's coming. So when we see, well, the things of the world go a bit crazy, as we have seen, we don't fear we don't quake in our shoes. We don't give up hope, but we simply know our God's in control and we can rest in his sovereign care. And so we want to know about this individual. He plays a strategic role in the end times events. A hundred passages in the Bible mention this individual. Now, I don't know if you know anything about hermeneutical principles. That is a very cool word for the art and science of Bible study. But anytime something is mentioned uh, more than once or twice, we want to know about it. When it's mentioned 100 times, we really want to know about it. And so we want to dive in and understand these hundred passages. As I told you, I have a lot to say today, amen? All right, we won't do all 100. We'll do 97. Um, but I do believe we would be wise to supplement our knowledge of him from what we've learned in Daniel 7 with some of the key passages of the 100 and relevant information about who the Antichrist is. And so as we do, here's what's going to happen. We're going to gain a more complete picture of this terrible event that's going to precede Christ's millennial reign of peace and prosperity. And my friends, I cannot wait for the blessed hope of when the Lord Jesus Christ, he brings the, the history of the world to its climax and he sits on the literal throne of David in Jerusalem and we rule and reign with the king in a thousand years of peace and prosperity. Amen. It's something we all desire and it will come to fruition. He's promised it. And our God is a promise maker and a promise keeper. And so before we get started, let me give you a comforting truth that comes straight from the scriptures. There it is in your notes. Do you see it there? Before the great tribulation and the rise of the Antichrist, the Lord will remove all believers from the earth. Now, there are several biblical passages that bear this truth out, but two are very significant that I want to look at here this morning. One is in Revelation 3.10. We read the words of Jesus to the Philadelphian believers, and here's what he says, because you have kept the word of my perseverance, I also will keep you from the hour of testing, that hour which is about to come upon the whole world to test those who dwell on the earth. Now, I want to break this down for just a moment here. The Greek expression translated to keep. Look in your notes there. Here's what it means. It means to preserve something outside of the sphere of something else. He's going to preserve them outside of the sphere of, well, what's taking place here on earth. 
The great tribulation, as we know, is God's pouring his wrath out on an unbelieving world in a last ditch effort to show them grace and mercy. And well, for the believer, there is no wrath in Jesus Christ. Amen. So Jesus is telling the Christians of the Philadelphian church that he's going to protect them from this worldwide testing by keeping them away from it. So what's the hour of testing? It's the tribulation, a seven year time span of severe divine judgment that we see described in Revelation chapter six through Revelation chapter 19. If you're really curious about that, you can go on the website or through the app and you can pick up our series on Revelation and go through those messages. I think there's about 27 of them that will take you through and you can get a better understanding there. And so in Paul's first letter to uh, the Thessalonian believers at the church at Thessalonica, he explains how the Lord's going to remove his people before the rest of the world experiences this awesome outpouring of God's wrath. And look at it there in 1 Thessalonians. If you have your Bible, flip over there with me if you'd like. Chapter 4, verse 14. Paul's speaking to the Thessalonian believers, and he says, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will not precede those who have fallen asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we shall always be with the Lord And I don't know, church, if we all say together, oh, Lord, come quickly. Mm. Now, the event that Paul's speaking about is commonly referred to as the rapture. Once it occurs, only unbelievers will be left on earth to experience divine judgment. And believers will be with the Lord. And we will revel with joy as we have perfect relationship and communion with the one who has purchased us with his blood. Now, although non-Christians get no pleasure in this prediction, we Christians can comfort one another with these words, Paul says in verse 18. These are words of comfort to the believer. Now, if we were to skim some books and listen to some sermons on biblical prophecy, we would find some general misconceptions about the Antichrist that we need to correct. And so I want to give you some basic information about the Antichrist, and then I want to dive in to some very relevant passages to help us understand what I'm about to lay out to you. First off, in your notes there, uh, the Antichrist will be wanted, not rejected. Throughout time, people have always followed evil men and evil women who made promises to give them what they wanted. This kind of blind, selfish devotion, but well, has always and frequently developed in countries that have experienced political and economic and moral and religious deterioration. This such turmoil, the false messiahs, tyrannical rulers have, have historically gained popular approval that they probably otherwise would have never have received. It's likely More than likely that the Antichrist rise to power will come during a time when people are longing for deliverance from very tumultuous and tough days. Secondly there, he will be appealing, not repulsive. Although the Antichrist will be a spiteful, beast-like nature, he's not going to be beastly in his appearance. You know, I think so often we think of, you know, Satan as this red-skinned, horned, ugly, wicked-looking creature. Oh, my friends, that's such an anti-biblical view. He is a beautiful angel, which is why he deceives so easily. Oh, listen, he's not going to be offensive in conduct, at least not initially, Instead, he's going to have this uncanny charisma that's going to win people over to his side. He's going to be extraordinary, not ordinary. He's going to have the oratorical skills of the best 
of earthly leaders, the inspirational power of a, of a Winston Churchill, the, the determination of a Joseph Stalin, the, the vision of a Karl Marx, the respectability of a Mother Teresa, the military prowess of the greatest generals of, of the earth's time, and the genius of King Solomon. And in addition to all this, he is going to be empowered by Satan himself. His incredible capabilities are going to be used against God's people. Look at that next fill in the blank there. He'll be a Gentile, not a Jew. So going back to a few weeks ago in Daniel chapter 7, indicates that the Antichrist is going to come from that divided Roman Empire, which is Gentile in origin. He's going to come from the Western world. Now with this little bit of context, I want to dig into the scriptures here. And so what does the Bible teach about the Antichrist? Why do we want to know about him? I heard this not long ago, and I thought, what a great illustration. When it gets to be about August, September, here in the States, and we start seeing the, the Christmas lights go up, <laughs> we start hearing the Christmas music begin to play, what do we know is coming? Christmas. Christmas is coming, but what do we know is going to happen sooner? Thanksgiving. So as we begin to see the signs of the times, we know the end is coming. But what comes sooner? The rapture of the church. That day when the last trump is sound. And the believers are called to meet the Lord in the air. And we will be with him forever and ever and ever. Amen. Let's dig into the scriptures here. What does the Bible teach us about the Antichrist? Look there at your notes. He will come to power out of the natural flow of events. He will come to power out of the natural flow of events. Daniel 7 tells us that the final world dictator is going to rise to power out of the natural flow of events. Look at at Daniel chapter 7, verse 24. Look at it there with me, would you? As for the ten horns out of this kingdom, ten kings will arise, and another will arise after them, and he'll be different from the previous ones and will subdue three kings. And so out of just the normal affairs and happenings of the world, he will arise. That, that is the, the stage, <coughs> pardon me, the stage is going to be set for him to put his insidious plan uh, to dominate our world into motion. This, this opportunity is going to occur shortly after the rapture of the church. Now listen, his religious position is no secret to anyone. Look at verse 25. He will speak out against the most high and wear down the saints of the highest one. He will intend to make alterations in times and in law, and they will be given into his hand for a time. This is going to be a political death spot like we've never seen before. He will even abolish all the previous laws and institute his own anti-God standards. That's what he's going to do. But he's going to rise to power of the natural flow of events. Really, it's kind of exciting days to be alive. Again, I don't know if this can happen. uh, It's going to happen tomorrow or 100 years from now. It can happen at any moment for sure. It's imminent. But we can definitely see the tumultuous nature of our world where people would long for someone like this to stand up and to lead. Amen? You can see how it could take place. Secondly, he will not rise to power until after the apostasy comes. Paul Paul writes to the church at Thessalonica... And he he writes to these believers there to to settle worries that was, well, the rumors were going around there in in Thessalonica that, well, the the Lord might have already returned. There was a a lot of concern about the second return of Christ, the second advent of Christ. Uh, These Christians had heard that the Lord had already returned and, well, he was ruling over the nations. I don't know about you, but if I heard that and maybe believed it, I might be a little upset as well, a little curious. Look at what Paul tells them in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Go ahead and flip over there in your Bibles. Let's read it together. Let's see this and study it together. Now we request you, brethren, with regard to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, that you not be quickly shaken from your composure or be disturbed either by a spirit or a message or a letter as if from us, 
to the effect that the day of the Lord has come. Let no one in any way deceive you, for it will not come unless the apostasy comes first and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. So what Paul is saying, listen, the second advent of Christ cannot take place until the apostasy and the the antichrist shows up. Now for us as believers, we may or may not ever know who the antichrist is because recall, he doesn't come to power until after the church is removed. But Paul here is informing them that his return is not going to incur until this apostasy takes place. And the Antichrist is revealed. Now, in in this context, the term apostasy refers to a period in which the world will make a dramatic shift, a, a dramatic turn away from God's standards and begin to hate him and his word. I don't know, it reminds me of what Paul told Timothy. 1 Timothy chapter 4, flip over there and look at it with me, would you? But the Spirit explicitly says that in later times, some will fall away from the faith, paying attention to deceitful spirits and doctrines of demons by means of the hypocrisy of liars seated in their own conscience, as with a branding iron, men who forbid marriage and advocate abstaining from foods which God has created to be gratefully shared in by those who believe and know the truth. I find it interesting, I'm not saying this has never happened in the history of the world, But isn't it interesting, all of these famous ex-evangelicals coming out? Isn't it interesting? Could we be in the beginning stages of the great apostasy? It does seem like every few weeks another famous Christian comes out as no longer a believer in the Lord Jesus. And they're coming from, well, the ranks of conservative Bible preaching, teaching ministries. Some are always a bit shocking. Paul goes on in 2 Timothy chapter three, if you flip over there, look at that in chapter three, verse one. But realize this, that in the last days, difficult times will come. For men will be lovers of self, lovers of money, boastful, arrogant, revilers, disobedient to parents, ungrateful, unholy, unloving, irreconcilable, malicious gossips, without self-control, brutal, haters of good, treacherous, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure, rather than lovers of God, holding to a form of godliness, although they have denied its power, avoid such men as these. I wonder... As we look around, this is not just an American phenomenon. We're not trying to read the scriptures through uh, our uh, nationalistic uh, culture. But across the world, we're the most narcissistic people on the planet. Just read a very fascinating study, by the way. Do you know the cause, the number one cause of narcissism in in our world? Not just the Western world, but across the globe. The rise of social media, it's caused every one of us to be little narcissists. Let's just be honest. I took a picture of my food and I posted it. I check every 15 or 20 minutes when I'm disciplined to see how many likes did my hamburger get. (laughs) If it doesn't get enough likes, I feel bad about myself. And so I'll erase it and I'll post something else. Now, I'm just kidding. I don't necessarily do that. I've maybe a couple of times. But, uh, but in this study, that's what it was talking about. We have created a culture of many narcissists. We all think we're better than everybody else. And that's not just an American phenomenon. We have turned into lovers of self. We've turned into, uh, well, this whole idea that Paul speaks about malicious gossips without self-control. I look at what we call Christian Twitter. Shameful, supposed men of God, pastors, believers, deacons, Sunday school teachers, men and women of the Lord who speak maliciously and arrogantly and uh, wickedly to one another. And this is supposedly the godliest of the crew. Let me say this. You ever see me do that? Rebuke me publicly, please. I don't ever want to be that way. Ever. But I wonder, are we moving into this age of apostasy? People are lovers of pleasure. It's all about pleasure. 
We're no longer tethered to the truths of Scripture. Look at what's going on right here, the month of June. It's Pride Month. And listen, if you're listening via live stream or you're in this room and you deal with these areas of LGBTQ+, plus, we love you. We love you so much. We believe that every one of us was created by God according to his design, and we leave his design. Some of us do it with gluttony. Some of us do it with, with hate. Some of, it, of us do it with fornication and sexual immorality and pornography. Some of us do it with, well, alternative lifestyles in the LGBTQ plus uh, spectrum. But we all leave his design, and that's called sin, and it leads to brokenness and heartache. And the only fix is the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only fix for the glutton. It's the only fix for the liar. It's the only fix for the homosexual, for the fornicator, for the adulterer. It's the only fix, my friends. It's Jesus. And oh, we desire for everyone to seek wholeness and holiness. We don't look down upon you. We are simply in the ranks of brokenness as well. And we desire for you God's best. But we see this apostasy take place when even the cute little blues clues blues clues has an entire segment brainwashing our children in this ungodly perversion of God's design it's been all over social media the cartoon and what's taking place that's just one of the cartoons Oh, my friends, are we in the great apostasy? I don't know. We can have a great awakening, amen? Praise God. Let's believe it will happen. Maybe that will take place a thousand years from now. But if we are in the great apostasy, we as the believers who who hold the book that answers the existential questions of life of how we got here and why is this world so jacked up? Why is this world so messed up? Why are we so broken? And the answer is to the fix. It's the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And then what happens next? He tells us right here. It's called Bible prophecy. And then what takes place after this life? It's either heaven or hell, which Pastor Drew did such a phenomenal job preaching on these past two weeks. There is two places to go, heaven or hell. And the only determination in that is what you do with the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so, my friends, we have the answers. We must know. We can't sit idly by, silent, and let our friends, our neighbors, and oh, my Lord, even our family members who don't know the Lord simply go on down the road to a place into oblivion because we were too weak. We were too meek. We were too gentle to have the loving conversations. Oh, my friends, Satan is sifting us. And we're allowing it to happen. During this time of heightened rebellion called the great apostasy, the one who epitomizes sin and, and whose end is everlasting destruction, he's going to be unveiled at some point. He's going to oppose Christianity and, and all other religions, by the way. Because he wants to exalt himself and himself alone above every so-called God and every object of worship. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 verse 4, look at it. Who opposes and exalts himself above every so-called God or object of worship so that he takes his seat in the temple of God displaying himself as being God. He will even sit on the throne of God in the inner sanctuary of the temple in Jerusalem and call himself the Lord. Did you guys know there's massive efforts to rebuild the temple? There's organizations that already have built the utensils. (laughs) They're ready. The day is coming. Will we see the day? I don't know. But my prayer as fellowshippers, those who sit under the preaching of my voice, that we will stand true to the Lord Jesus Christ regardless of what comes. And so I want you to know what is on the horizon so when you see these things happen, you you don't freak out and sit back and give out and give up all hope. But you can embrace the fact that God is sovereign and he has told us of these things and we can remain faithful followers 
Listen, there is no room for cultural Christianity in the book right here that I'm reading. You're either a legit follower of the Lord Jesus Christ or you're not. My friend, what are you? Are you following the book? Are you denying self? Are you obeying the scriptures? Are you following his example? Or do you wear the cross and say you're a Christian until times get tough? Let's be followers of the Lord Jesus Christ. Look at that next little fill in the blank. He will come from the revived Roman Empire. Revelation 13, verses 1 and 2. And the dragon stood on the sand of the seashore. And then I saw a beast coming up out of the sea, having ten horns and seven heads. And on his horns were ten diadems. On his head were blasphemous names. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard. And his feet were like those of a bear. And his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him power and his throne and great authority. So this passage right here, Revelation chapter 13, identifies the Antichrist as the ruler of the revived Roman Empire that Daniel spoke about in Daniel chapter 7. Now, Revelation 17, 7, the angel said to me, why do you wonder? I will tell you the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carries her, which is the seven heads and the ten horns. Then look at 17 verse 12. The ten horns which you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but they receive authority as kings with the beast for one hour. These have one purpose and they give their power and authority to the beast. Now let me go back to Daniel chapter 7 verse 7 and 8. After this I kept looking in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrifying and extremely strong and it had large iron teeth. It devoured and crushed and trampled down the remainder with its feet and it was different from all the beasts that were before it and it had ten horns. While I was contemplating the horns, behold, another horn, a little one, came up among them. And three of the first horns were pulled out by the roots before it. And behold, this horn possessed eyes like the eyes of a man and a mouth uttering great boasts. So many of the characteristics of the Greek, the Medo-Persian, the Babylonian uh, empires are going to be evident in him and in his rule. But, but he will not be humanly or divinely empowered. The text, did you pick up on it, says the source of his power The source of his prestige, the source of his authority is going to be the dragon. That is Satan himself. At some point, the Bible does not tell us, but at some point before his ultimate height of power, the Antichrist is going to receive a wound that would normally be fatal, but instead of dying, he's going to be miraculously healed by Satan. Hey, understand something. Satan is an imitator, not an innovator, okay? He is a joke. All he does is see what our Heavenly Father does, and he tries to make a cheap little spin-off of it. That's what he does. His greatest weapon is lies. Our greatest weapon, the truth, the Word of God, the holy, inspired, inerrant, infallible Holy Scriptures. That's our weapon. Do not be scared or nervous about the enemy. What does the Bible say? Flee the devil or resist the devil. He flees from you. He has no power over the believer. As long as you resist him, he imitates whatever he does. He sees what the Lord does. He does a cheap version knockoff. He's like a toddler. When my boys say something or do something, Lincoln parrots it. They say something, gets a laugh. He says it 400 times. (laughs) Satan is an imitator, not an innovator. You see what he's trying to do here? Antichrist dies. He miraculously brings him back to life. You see what he's trying to do? He's trying to imitate the king. There isn't no imitation of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this seemingly supernatural event is going to amaze the people of the world. Why is it going to amaze them? Because they're not anchored to the truth of scriptures. It's going to amaze them because their eyes have been blinded and they see only what they see in front of them. My friends, there's more going on in our world than meets the eye. Revelation 13, 3, I saw one of his heads as if it had been slain and his fatal wound was healed and the whole earth was amazed and followed after the beast. The Bible says that people will worship Satan. Look at verse four there. They worship the dragon because he gave his authority to the beast. They worship the beast saying, who is like the beast? Who is able to wage war with him? So this wicked ruler is gonna have an accomplice. 
He's going to have this false prophet who's going to operate with the same satanic authority and support and the worship and the rule of the Antichrist. Now, let's look there at uh, verses 11 and 12. Then I saw another beast coming up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb and he spoke as a dragon. He exercises all the authority of the first beast in his presence. And he makes the earth and those who dwell in it to worship the first beast whose fatal wound was healed. The false prophet is going to perform counterfeit miracles that are going to deceive the masses into worshiping an image of the world dictator. Look at verse 13 and 14. He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down out of heaven to the earth in the presence of men. He deceives those who dwell on the earth because of the signs which it was given him to perform in the presence of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who had the wound of the sword and has come to life. And then verse 15 says, anyone who refuses to bow down and to serve and to worship the image is going to be killed. And the Antichrist conspirator is going to demand that everyone receive the mark. Do you see it in verse 16? And he causes all the small, the great, the rich, the poor, the free men, the slaves to be given a mark on their right hand or on their forehead. Listen, you will not take the mark by accident. You know you're taking the mark because you know you're worshiping the beast. You won't be tricked into it. And the mark will either be the name of the beast or the number of his name. Do you see in verse 17 and 18, look at it. He provides that no one will be able to buy or to sell except the one who has the mark, either the name of the beast or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him who has understanding calculate the number of the beast. For the number is that of a man and his number is 666. Now, so many interpretations of this. We could go crazy and geek out over 666. We could get all kinds of freaky up in here. Because people have. But here's what we know. Probably the best prediction or interpretation of this is that the number six is one less than seven, which is the perfect number. And the threefold repetition of six simply indicates that for all their pretensions of deity, Satan and the two beasts are not the Holy Trinity. They're just creatures, not the creator. And so even in the name... They say, guys, I'm less than the original. He's an imitator, not an innovator. Look at that next fill in the blank there. We got to go. He will be dethroned at the second coming of Jesus Christ. He will be dethroned at the second coming of Jesus Christ. So the dethronement and the demise of the the Antichrist, the false prophet, are going to occur at the second coming of Christ. This happens at the end of the tribulation when the world dictator, uh, the nation's leaders, all their military forces are going to be assembled at Armageddon for that great battle to fight against Christ and his army. And the Lord is going to capture the Antichrist with the sword of his mouth. He's going to speak truth and lay waste to the enemies of our creator. And he's going to capture the Antichrist, the false prophet, and throw them into the lake of fire. You heard about that last week. Revelation 19, 19, and 20. And I saw the beast and the kings of the earth and their armies assembled to make war against him who sat on the horse and against his army. And the beast was seized, and with him the false prophet who performed the signs in his presence, by which he deceived those who had received the mark of the beast, and those who worshipped his image. These two were thrown alive in a lake of fire which burns with brimstone. Christ will also destroy the armies of Armageddon and any other individual on earth who had yet to trust Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins all around the globe, and they will stand before him at the great judgment. So let me wrap up by asking a question. What in the world do we do with all this? What do we do with this idea, theology of the Antichrist as Christians? I mean, certainly many of the events that we have just described here are horrible. But if we are trusting Jesus as Savior and Lord, if we're truly following him, have a relationship with him, we need not expect them with fear. After all, he's going to take all Christians to be with him prior to the tribulation and the Antichrist's ascension to power. Yet listen, listen, the Lord does teach us to stay alert. Have you read Matthew chapter 25? Look at that next one in the blank there. Here's what you and I can learn from this. Stay alert in your spiritual walk as you watch for his imminent return to rapture the church. Matthew chapter 25, verse 13. Man, it's an interesting chapter, by the way. You got time, read it. 
He says, be, this is Jesus, be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. And so in obedience to chapter 25, here are a few things that you and I as Christians can do. Three things that you and I can do to help us stay watchful. You ready for them? Watch the news with your eyes on the Middle East. Watch the news with your eyes on the Middle East. It all goes down there. Now, let me encourage you. Let's say something crazy happened and Iran pushed Israel into the ocean. That does not hurt or harm our faith. It just means this was not the, the reconstituted Israel that God was speaking of in the end times. It will happen at another time. But my friends, watch the news with your eyes in the Middle East. Number two, interpret current events with your minds on prophetic truth. So as you see the, the apostatizing of our world, and when we talk about the great apostasy, it's not an American phenomenon. You can see it take place around the globe. Although there are great revivals taking place in the global south, you see the apostasy all over the place. But as you see them, don't interpret these current events of apostasy through the lens of, well, the world or hopelessness, but through the lens of biblical prophecy. And it will build you up and encourage you and embolden you in your faith. And thirdly, anticipate Christ's return with your hearts on the Lord's promise the rapture of the church. When that last trump is sounded, in the twinkling of an eye, and you're caught up to meet the Lord in the air, how will he find you? Following or apostatizing? The next event on God's great calendar is the removal of all believers from planet Earth. Let me ask you a sobering question. Are you ready for the rapture of the church? Do you know anyone who's not? You know, it's difficult to study future events without becoming burdened for someone who doesn't know Christ. Who has the Lord laid on your heart? Who has the Lord laid on your heart that does not know the Lord? And begin praying specifically that the Lord will give you opportunities to, to speak the truth, to speak the truth in love, to have the hard conversations, but through the, the lens of the gospel to this individual. And as believers, our job is to sow gospel seed wherever we go. One thing I love about our church is we're a gospel sowing church. Here's what I need you to do. If you believe in the imminent return of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you believe there is a hell and a heaven and the only difference of where you go is what you do with the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, if you are truly uh, believe the word to be the truth, Let's sow gospel seed. Here's what I'm asking you to do. We've got uh, several bags uh, of our saturated materials left right out there in the lobby. I need every family to take a bag. Every family go out there after this service and take a bag because there is a household somewhere that has yet to hear the gospel. And in that bag, you're going to get uh, the Jesus video, the Jesus film, which has been viewed by billions and literally millions have come to Christ through it. We have people in our church who have come to Christ because of the Jesus film that we have placed on their door. There is the, the four spiritual laws. There is little booklets in there. There's also an invite to VBS and uh, to our fellowship fest. But here's what we know according to the Jesus film folks. For every video that gets put in a home, it's watched seven plus times. When are you going to go into your neighbor's house and share the gospel seven times? You can with a Jesus film. Friend, will you be burdened for people created on purpose, for great purpose, in the image of God? And will you go out there and grab a bag? It's a hundred households. Begin to walk, follow the map, hang it on the door and pray over every one of those. Pray for opportunity maybe to speak to that person. If not, you just leave and keep walking. When this service is over, when we say amen, before you go to Sunday school, we go get a bag. My friend, there is a lost world out there. There are a bunch of cultural Christians who need to be re-engaged. And it's up to us to do our part to fulfill the Great Commission. We do that by living for the good of the community, the glory of Christ, and the salvation of all. 
Pastor Sean, as he comes to play, let's just bow our heads. And I want you right now to ask yourself, am I ready for the rapture? And what am I doing to help others? We must become evangelistic. We must become evangelists. We must become people who share our faith. You can do it, my friends. I know you can. You know the Bible. You love the Lord. You know the truth. You've got the answers to the great questions of life. You know that he died on the cross and he rose from the dead to take away the sins of the world. Share it with somebody. Maybe you're here this morning or you're streaming and you've, you've yet to place your faith in Jesus Christ. You've yet to begin to follow him. If the rapture were to occur today, you're nervous you wouldn't go. Today, put your faith in Jesus and begin to follow him by denying self, obeying the scriptures and following his example. You can pray a prayer like this. Just simply say, dear Jesus, I believe. I believe you are who you say you are. You died on the cross and you rose from the dead. I believe that you are the Lord God and I ask you to come into my life to save me. Help me to follow you. That when you do come, I will be found faithful. And as we stand here in just a moment to worship, believer, would you be found faithful as a follower of the Lord Jesus Christ? Are you Christian in name only? Maybe you go to Bible studies here and there. For the most part, you're a Christian in name only. He's called us to follow him. Would you follow him with all that you have? So Father in heaven, we ask that this morning that you'd get a hold of our hearts, that you'd break revival out within, well, each of us. Lord, I pray you'd break revival out in my heart, that you'd forgive me of my sins, Lord. That when you do return, you'd find me faithful. And when I am faithless, I turn to the gospel to receive grace because that's the good news of Christianity. We always have grace. There is no condemnation for those that are in Jesus Christ. And so if you're here this morning and you're feeling some condemnation about uh, the way uh, you've lived your life, turn to Jesus and receive grace, something great you don't deserve. Oh Lord, get a hold of our hearts now in Jesus' name. May the Holy Spirit fall. Amen. Let's worship, my friends. Stand with me. If you need prayer, we'll be right here. Hey, church, thank you again for joining us here at FC at Home. We hope that uh, you were blessed by the worship and the message Amen. today. And, you know, Pastor, I couldn't help but uh, think of that old adage, know your enemy. Yeah. Uh, and, and if you don't know your enemy, you become your enemy, right? Yeah. And yeah. so, uh, you know, you were talking at the beginning about why it's important to know who the Antichrist is and his tactics and everything that mm -hmm. uh, is wrapped up in it. Why do we why do we study uh, the Antichrist and put so much emphasis on knowing mm -hmm. uh, who he is? No, a great question. Well, one, as I mentioned earlier, he's mentioned a hundred times in the Word of God. Anytime something's mentioned repetitively, we need to understand uh, who the Word of God is speaking about and how that interacts with us. But secondly, I, I heard this from Dr. David Jeremiah the other day. He said, you know, when it comes to August, September, and you begin to see all the Christmas lights and the Christmas paraphernalia being put out in the stores, what does that mean? It means Christmas is coming. True, but it also means Thanksgiving is coming sooner. As we see the signs of the Antichrist, one, it reminds us, as all Bible prophecy does, God is in control. That's right. God has this thing planned out, but it also means, well, the rapture of the church is coming sooner. Yes. And so the next prophetic event on God's uh, timetable is the rapture of the church. Something we can so look forward to is he takes us to be with him. And so my friend, it's important for us to know Bible prophecy because it encourages us, it emboldens us in our faith, and it reminds us that our God is victorious and we can rest in him because if he has this entire world under control, that means he's got our little world under control. And so Pastor Sean, pray for those that are maybe going through some difficulties and maybe they're a bit fearful about what's happening and what's taking place, uh, that they could just be encouraged. 
All right, let's pray. Father, we come this morning to uh, simply, one, be still and know that you are the King of heaven. You are the God of glory. You are our comforter and our peace and our rest. And no matter what we face, God, no matter what may come our way, we find our, our faith and our dependence and our rest in you. And so, God, I pray for those that are maybe experiencing the, the attack of, of the enemy. Uh, they may be experiencing hardship and pain. I pray today they would know mm -hmm. that the return, the, the rapture of the church yes. and the return of Christ is at hand. It's closer than mm -hmm. it ever has been mm -hmm. before. And Lord, that they would look to heaven and continue to worship you in the storm, mm -hmm. continue to lay their lives down in, in obedience to you. Mm -hmm. And Father, just commit their way uh, unto you that you might walk with them and guide their steps and their path. And Lord, may we all have that attitude mm -hmm. as we approach uh, this idea of Antichrist coming, mm -hmm. uh, Lord, I pray that we would all look to you and run to you uh, as our only hope and our only defense. And so, Lord, we give you glory today. Go with us into this week. Father, fill us with your spirit that we might live for the good of the community, the glory of Christ, and the salvation of all. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.